glaucoma is one of the leading causes of preventable blindness in the United States, and a disease that you will likely encounter in clinical practice, regardless of your chosen field. This video is meant to provide a simple overview of glaucoma and to help you understand the types of screening we perform and why. We will also review how to use and take care of the tono pen. Before we discuss glaucoma further, it's necessary to first understand the normal pathway of aqueous humor drainage in the eye. Aqueous humor is produced by the ciliary body in the posterior chamber at a rate of 2 to 3 microliters per minute. After filling the posterior chamber, aqueous moves forward around the lens and through the pupil to fill the anterior chamber. At the angle formed by the iris and cornea, aqueous drains through the trabecular meshwork into the canal of Schlem. Normal intraocular pressure is maintained by a careful equilibrium between aqueous production and drainage. Any disruption of this drainage can result in elevated intraocular pressure, which may compress the optic nerve and affect vision. With this anatomy in mind, we can now discuss glaucoma. Glaucoma is a group of eye diseases characterized by injury to the optic nerve, which may or may not be associated with elevated intraocular pressure, also called IOP. There are two main types of glaucoma. It can be subdivided into open angle glaucoma and angle closure glaucoma. In primary open angle glaucoma, the optic nerve becomes damaged for unknown reasons. Presumably, degeneration of the aqueous humor outflow pathway, probably the trabecular meshwork, leads to aqueous backup and chronically elevated intraocular pressure. Over time, the ganglion nerves in the retina will atrophy. Patients experience peripheral visual field loss, which usually occurs so gradually that it is asymptomatic in the early stages. The second type of classification for glaucoma is angle closure, which is a narrowing or closure of the anterior chamber angle. Aqueous humor egress is blocked, but the dramatic elevation in IOP occurs over hours, compressing the optic nerve and leading to irreversible blindness if left untreated. Acute angle closure is an ophthalmic emergency, and patients will be recognized by severely elevated intraocular pressures, a hard and excruciatingly painful eye, redness of the eye, and halos in their vision that come from corneal edema, or thickening. For the purposes of today's video, we will be focusing on primary open angle glaucoma, which is far more common in the United States. As mentioned previously, glaucoma is the second leading cause of blindness in the world, and a leading cause of blindness among African Americans. In the United States alone, we spend about $1.5 billion per year on glaucoma treatments. Despite its potentially grim prognosis, glaucoma can be delayed or halted if it is detected early enough. In order to do this, screening is essential, because the vision loss associated with glaucoma is so gradual that it's usually asymptomatic. By the time the patient notices what is happening, it may be too late to restore vision. The vision loss in glaucoma is irreversible. Certain populations have a higher risk of developing glaucoma, warranting closer surveillance and screening. Major risk factors include age, race, family history, and elevated intraocular pressure. Age is an important factor. The prevalence of open-angle glaucoma is less than 1% under 55 years of age, approaches 2% at age 65, and reaches 4% at age 80. Also, the older the patient, the more likely the patient is to suffer from blindness from open-angle glaucoma. Race is also influential. For unknown reasons, blacks are three times as likely to develop primary open-angle glaucoma, and far more likely to develop lasting complications associated with the disease. Third, we're concerned for any patient with a family history of glaucoma. The Baltimore Eye Survey found that the relative risk of open-angle glaucoma increased 3.7 and 2.2-fold for individuals with an affect affected sibling or parent, respectively. Lastly, there is a strong association between elevated IOP and glaucoma. However, one-third to one-half of individuals with glaucomatous field defects have intraocular pressures less than 21 millimeters of mercury or equal to it when first detected, 
normal IOP ranges from 8 to 21 millimeters of mercury. In addition, over 90% of adults with pressures greater than 21 have no optic nerve damage. Other possible risk factors include hypertension, diabetes, and myopia. There are three main parameters we assess when screening for glaucoma. Visual field testing, which tests peripheral vision. The fundus examination, which allows direct visualization of the optic nerve in its cup and intraocular pressures. Visual field testing looks for early asymptomatic losses. Confrontational field testing is not reliable. So one other method is automated perimetry, which we discuss in this or an adjacent video. The fundus examination, and specifically the presence of cupping, has the highest sensitivity and specificity of any other finding on eye examination. Cupping describes a hollowed out appearance of the optic nerve. As you can see in the adjacent photo, the cup is the lighter area where the vessels will dive into the nerve. A cup whose diameter is greater than 50% of the vertical disc diameter is indicative of glaucoma. The picture to the right shows you how the cup to disc ratio is calculated. Lastly, we measure intraocular pressures. We consider elevated pressures anything above 21 millimeters of mercury. Intraocular pressures are easily measured in an outpatient setting and are a quick way to determine who to refer to more specialized care. Although there are several ways to measure IOP, we will focus on this video on using the tono pen, which is portable and doesn't require the use of a slit lamp. The tono pen measures the IOP indirectly by measuring the amount of force required to flatten the constant area of cornea. You may have one of these in your emergency room or office. This is the tono pen without the cover. The covers are sterile and so you want them in this kind of packet. You want to tear open the packet and you want to place them into the blue side. You don't want to touch the front part of it uh, because that will actually make it not sterile. So you put this part down, you scroll it down, and then just take off the cardboard piece. It is very important that the cover not be applied too tightly, as on the left-hand side, or too loosely, as on the right-hand side. Applying it too tightly will cause the reading to be falsely high, whereas applying it too loosely, as on the right side, will cause a falsely low reading. Next, turn on the tono pen and look at the display screen. If it reads CAL, then calibration is required. We will go through how to calibrate in the following slide. If not, the tono pen may be ready to be used right away. You will have two dashed lines in that case. So calibrate. it says Point calibrate. You want to hold it down pointing the all the way down. Press the operator's button two times. Going to make a long beep. Hold it the all the way down. Will beep and display CAL for calibrate. Then you will hear a second beep, and the display will change from CAL to up. Immediately invert the tono pen, pointing the transducer end straight up. If done correctly, the display will then read good. Now press the operator's button one more time, and the At double row point, dashes is You displayed. have done a proper calibration. The instrument is now ready to measure now the IOP. Now you can press the operator's button or the what main follows button one more will time. Be you seeing and the at that point, screen. you will have a double row of Remember dashes that to displayed. invert the machine once this it tells says you that the instrument the is ready to measure the intraocular pressure. This is an example of a calibrated tono pen, which is ready to, ca to measure intraocular pressure. Next, you will anesthetize the cornea with eye drops. To do so, instruct the patient to tilt their head back slightly and look up. Use the thumb of your non-dominant hand to hold the upper lid margin open. You can start at the lash margin right by where the lashes start 
and touch that skin to the periorbital bony tissue above. Use the pinky of your non-dominant hand, the one that's holding the eye drops, to do the same for the lower lid margin and quickly place one to two eye drops in the pocket created below. After the eye drops have been placed, instruct the patient to look straight ahead and open their eyes widely. Hold the tono pen as you would a pencil. Depress the operator's button once and make sure that the two dash lines are indicated. Use the tip of the tono pen to lightly tap the cornea several times in rapid succession. You need only touch lightly. You do not need to press hard. Only brief contact with the cornea is required each time and you will hear a beep every time that happens. It's very important not to apply pressure to the eyeball with your fingers as you're holding the eyelids apart, since this can increase the intraocular pressure reading. You will want to hold the eyelids as we discussed before. Touch by the lash margin and touch it up to the bony part of the periorbital area. You do not want to press on the eyeball itself. Again, a chirp will sound every time a valid reading is obtained. After several readings, a final beep will sound, and the averaged IOP measurement will appear on the display. On the display, a single IOP number will be shown. This is the average. In addition, a horizontal bar will appear above one of four numbers on the tono pen below the readout. This indicates the statistical reliability of the average measurement. For example, if a horizontal bar appears above the number 10, as in below on the left, the standard deviation of the IOP measurements is 10% or less of the number shown. If the display indicates a standard deviation that's greater than 5, which is the picture to the right, uh, then you may want to repeat the measurement. Do the same for the other eye. When you have finished using the tono pen, remember to throw out the used tip cover and replace it with a new one. Only then can you return the tono pen to its case. So this is the tono pen. There's actually a uh, tool that comes with it to open the device. So you want to go right into this back slot. There's a little hole right there. Put the tool in and you can actually shimmy out the battery cover. So you have your two batteries here. To remove them, you actually press on those two and you replace them with batteries at the same time. The Tono Pen is especially useful in the outpatient screening setting, but there are some limitations that you should be aware of. In general, it is not as accurate as applination tonometry shown to the right, which is usually performed as part of the slit lamp examination. As mentioned previously, mechanical pressure unknowingly applied to the eyeball by the examiner can result in a falsely high IOP reading. Finally, corneal thickness is an important factor that may influence the reading. The tono pen measures the amount of force required to flatten the cornea. People with naturally thick corneas require more pressure and is read as a higher IOP. This number does not necessarily reflect aqueous humor retention or increased pressure inside the eye. Most people with open angle glaucoma will not present with pressures above 30, but in the following slide, we will tell you what the cutoffs are for any emergent referrals. If this should happen to you and you should see a pressure greater than 30, an urgent referral within 24 hours is necessary if there are no symptoms suggesting acute glaucoma. Whereas if the pressure is above 40, you must emergently, emergently refer to the nearest ophthalmologist. Intraocular pressures from 25 to 29 need evaluation within one week, and pressures between 23 and 24 warrant repeat measurement to confirm and or refer for comprehensive eye examination. As a preventative measure, we consider starting the patient on medication when we record, record an IOP greater than 22 millimeters on two separate occasions, or if there are evidence of glaucomatous changes, such as high cupped disc ratio, or 
visual field loss consistent with glaucoma.